Hi, Paul Beckwith, uh, University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology. This is uh, the this poster is of the Ice Age mammals of the Alaskan tundra. Um, which ones? Anyway, it's my backdrop. Just wanted to switch it up a little bit. I'm continuing on talking about uh, natural hazards. So I was talking about earthquake uh, scenarios, uh, a, 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 something called haywired, where where uh, there's a major fault on the Hayward. Uh, fault line, 52 mile long fault line, 7.0, and how it could basically decimate parts of uh, Silicon Valley and have huge uh, effects across the U.S. because it's one of the most heavily urbanized faults in the world. The next talk after that was by John Rundle, a physicist, um, University of California, and he was looking at risk management in earthquakes and compared it to the game of 21 or blackjack. Um, so I guess he, I, I know where he went between uh, talks or in, in the evenings uh, across the road from the convention center to Harris to, uh, you know, test out his uh, theories. Um, so the whole idea is how do you manage your risk? I mean, this isn't just in natural hazards, you know, earthquakes, uh, Extreme weather event. How how do you manage your your risk? So this has been studied for in games of chance for a long period of time. Claude Shannon, one of the pioneers. You know what bet size is optimal, whether it be in stock markets or um, stocks. So Bill Miller, uh, Ed Thorpe. These are some of the people um, that have studied this a lot in the past. Um, so you know basically you have a stochastic process, so random process, you know, but there's, uh, you know, what strategy do you use to, if you can get an edge, um, then there's something called the Kelly criterion, and depending on what edge you have, that would determine your, your bet size. So, so this guy, Ed Thorpe, he systematically won in the game of 21 blackjack in the 1960s. So he figured out this theory um, figured out the edge and applied it until all the casinos uh, banned him. So, so it's something called the Kelly, Kelly criteria, and you can find out more about it by, um, you know, by by just uh, googling it, having a look at some of the theory. I'm not going to get into that, um, but the, this stuff is used um, by the big by big guys. Like there's something called catastrophe bonds, and there's a website www. Artemis, A-R-T-E-M-I-S dot B-M. Um, it's a cat catastrophe, catastrophe bond site, and it uses criteria like that to set up these bonds um, to sort of, sort of, you know, to, to sort of try to calculate the risks of, of uh, events, and then, and then uh, you know, uh, hey, you know, where anybody, people can make, will make a buck where they can make a buck. So, um, so how does this relate? It turns out that um, this can relate to earthquakes. So there's an article in the New York Times in 2010 called A Richter Scale for Markets. And it's about how you, you have, you plot probability versus time, cumulative probability, and then you could do kind of time casting and you can figure out roughly how much time will occur uh, between different events. Um, the, uh, in the markets, there's something called the VIX, V-I-X, the fear index. And this sort of, this VIX thing, you know, it can be stable and then it can jump up and then decay down and then jump up. There can be like aftershocks in this VIX index and they can follow, uh, you know, the behavior of earthquake aftershocks. Um, or, you know, you could also relate it to extreme weather events like flooding and stuff. So there's a whole, um, there's a whole website, um, the Miller value, Bill Miller uses earthquakes to predict the markets, okay? So this physicist was sort of studying this sort of thing, trying to, rel the Miller value project or, um, Anyway, you could Google Bill Miller, uh, earthquakes, stock markets, find all this stuff if you're interested in pursuing that. I don't know how relevant that is, but uh, 
John Rundle is the guy who gave the talk, so it was all about wicked problems. You know, how could maybe we can treat wicked problems because there's so many unknowns. Maybe we can just model the the behavior of them using some of these uh, theories that he talks about. There was a guy from uh, New Zealand that was talking about building resilience. So, of course, New Zealand had their uh, big earthquake. They had a lot of, uh, a few years ago, um, they had a lot of problems. They're also trying to model, uh, you know, so what buildings stood in the earthquake, what ones didn't. Um, what about the coastlines? Uh, can they have, you know, and they're talking about managed retreat from coastlines within 30 years. You know, so, or how do you make, uh, how do you big build buildings along coastlines more resilient to withstand the high winds, um, but also to withstand uh, storm, you know, uh, sea level rise and things like that. So, you know, they're acknowledging that these things are happening. Of course, uh, risks are no more, nowhere more important than in Bangladesh. Uh, you know, every year, what is considered normal flooding, 20 to 30 percent of the country gets flooded. You know, from monsoonal flooding in Bangladesh, I had no idea it was that high. A really exceptional year, extreme year, would be 60 to 70 percent of the country gets flooding or, or higher. Um, so studies were being done on that. Um, you know, and, the, and these big cyclones that, that, that come through, um, they, they completely, you know, they can completely take out islands. Like there's an island on the, the main river, 10,000 families lived on this island. And a cyclone came through, completely destroyed the island, and the island reformed elsewhere from the sediment. So where do these people go? How do they live? You know, cyclones in, in Bangladesh um, have, have caused tremendous fatalities over the years. So Bola, 1970, nine meter storm surge, 300 to 500,000 people dead. Um, Gur Gurley, or Gurdy, 1991, 138,000 deaths. Sitter, SIDR, 2007, 4,300 deaths, right? So that's 100 times less deaths over 40 years. The size of these cyclones was comparable. What happened is there's a number of different things. The author um, contributed, attributed this um, great reduction in fatalities to concrete shelters, um, that elevated concrete shelters that could withstand the high winds from cyclones, but could, were also built, you know, well above, you know, well, well above a nine meter or 10 meter storm surge. So up, up high, you know, higher than the highest, uh, you know, storm surge thought that could happen. And people just crowded up into there and the fatalities were way down. So just something simple like that um, and training people so that when the storm is coming, they know where to go. So he attributed it mostly to that sort of thing for protecting people. But of course, you also have to have, you know, a, a good forecasting. So forecasting, you know, is much better now. You know, it's improved, of course, significantly in 40 years. And, uh, you know, the, the high resolution, detailed uh, meteorology. Um, so we know what's coming. So, so you can, uh, you know, you, uh, you, but you still, you know, what's coming is great, but you still have to have a place for people to go. And, and uh, so these uh, concrete shelters elevated have saved, literally, they've saved hundreds of thousands of lives um, from these big cyclones that are happening now. Um, but there's a huge earthquake risk also in Bangladesh. So, so you know, the capital, uh, Dhaka, 21% um, of the buildings are unreinforced brick. 77% are concrete. Um, a 7.0 earthquake would basically take out almost all of those buildings. None of them are built for earthquakes. So, you know, what do we do? Uh, you know, of course, as buildings, building lifetimes come to an end, you can, re you know, your new building can meet much higher code, but it's a poor country. What's the risk? It's not really being done. So, so you know, you mitigate against some risk, but then, you know, you let others slip through. And I guess that's part of something that needs to be looked at in much greater detail. So uh, wicked problems, deep uncertainties, tough challenges. Natural disasters claim lives and, and cause billions of dollars of losses around the world. Assessing and mitigating these hazards challenges society with wicked problems. Crucial info is missing. Proposed solutions are complex and they interact with other societal goals. I, how can we assess the hazard when the recurrence interval, for example, of large earthquakes, floods, 
or hurricanes is changing in time or is expected to do so. You know, so you have to, you know, you have to look at this pyramid structure. You have to look at the science and then the engineering and then the societal implications and the policy implications and you know it's a huge it's a very multidisciplinary sort of sort of thing um you know there's an optimum amount of mitigation right because uh that's the big the biggest bang uh in terms of life save for for buck you know typically we under mitigate we don't often over mitigate or 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 mitigate over mitigate by a significant amount because that's that's a much higher higher cost uh, for example same sort of thing and you know how safe do you build a car right like you could make a car so that nobody would ever die in a traffic accident but it would cost you a million dollars or something right so you know you don't you don't uh, right so so cost always enter you know and then you get ethical questions what's the cost of a human life anyway to better understand and quantify and manage these natural hazards and risks, you know, very multidisciplinary hydrology, the atmosphere, seismology, computer scenarios and studies, uh, you know, insurance companies comes into it. You know, uh, for example, um, this guy, Mark Powell from RMS Risk Management Solutions talked about wind versus water damage in hurricanes multi-perils and it's an insurance problem so for example Katrina you know flood insurance uh, flood insurance um, people aren't covered generally for flood insurance or they weren't during Katrina and they're still not but they were covered for wind insurance there was a high premium but people were covered so uh, so along comes uh, the hurricane and uh, you know your, your house gets damaged by winds or doesn't get damaged by winds and then the water rises and your house floats off and you have a total write-off so if you're the insurance company you're going to say that the house floated off and it was completely destroyed by the, the flood the water and then you don't have to cover cover the cost if you're the homeowner you're going to say that the house was destroyed by the high winds and then the shell or the hulk of the house whatever was left was carried off so the damage was done to the wind and then you get coverage so of course, there was enormous, uh, you know, there was enormous uh, number of lawsuits uh, after Katrina in 2005, after Ike in 2008, you know, on uh, was the damage due to winds, was it due to water, if it's, if it's a combination of both, uh, you know, who pays, the insurance pays for the wind part, the government, um, you know, maybe FEMA, you can get money for the flood part, so it's a quagmire of lawsuits and mitigation and uh you know it was a good cottage industry for for scientists who would go and you know for wind experts and flood experts because they could go and testify you know uh whether they you know depending on who hired them whether it was a homeowner or whether it was the insurance company you know and of course uh sea level rise you know there's a huge sort of protection gap if you like uh you know properties at risk so there's a national flood insurance plan, which came out of a coastal act, which was supposed to cover um, cover these sort of this this uh, protection gap in coverage to to uh, protect homeowners. But of course, it's deep in debt, and uh, you know, so people look at uh, setting up flood risk indexes. It's not just people on coasts; it's people in cities. So we're getting these. Um, you know these these torrential rain events that can flood out a city so you know what uh houses are vulnerable so this uh study by kelly klima at the rand corporation looked at pittsburgh and looked at severe precipitation and riverine flooding so flooding from the river and identified all of the houses and the vulnerabilities but in order to see how it affects people um, you know, and then the city does flood. One inch of rain, you get some flooding in in uh, underpasses and stuff, and people were actually killed with, with that little amount of rainfall. So, you know, you have to look at all of the societal functions. So, and so there was a um, regression analysis done to pick out the different components that were most important. And in terms of um, the housing type and the wealth was number one the build density and educational attainment was number two. Number three was the age and the health. So very young people, um, older people, um, the race, and that, had to, that also went back to, to poverty versus affluence. 
Um, the housing vacancy was, of course, important, and the, you know, the age, the elderly were really, really hit. People were put into these vulnerability classes, so th these type of studies are important for